Howdy guys, Cub here. Welcome to the Ultimate Survival Guide to Minecraft 1.13. In this video, we're going to be going over all the changes from Minecraft 1.13, also known as the Aquatic Update. And before we begin, I just want to mention I also have other videos from previous versions of Minecraft, previous Ultimate Survival Guides, dating all the way back to Minecraft 1.8 in September 2014. So if you haven't played in a while and want to get up to date on all of the relevant stuff to survival only, then go ahead and check out those videos. Link will be in the description. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get on with this video. Since Minecraft 1.13 is such a large update, I've broken down this video into five separate parts. The first part of the video will cover all the new blocks, including new recipes. The second part of the video will cover all the new mobs and all the changes to existing mobs. Third part of the video will cover water changes, including blocks that are waterlogged. The fourth part of the video will cover changes to world generation, including new biomes. And the fifth section of the video is going to be miscellaneous changes, which didn't fit in anywhere else. So I'll provide timestamps down in the description below. You can click on those to go to the section you want to watch, or just wait, and let's get started. So let's start off with some new blocks here. The first new blocks we'll take a look at are the stripped logs. So we have six new varieties of stripped logs. The way you make these are that you take normal logs found on trees and you simply right click them with your axe. And that basically strips the bark off of the logs and creates the stripped log variety. So then you can just simply left click and that will harvest the log itself. So that's how you get those different varieties of logs and then they place just like logs themselves so if you place them straight up and down they'll be straight up and down if you place them on the side they'll be sideways so those are the stripped logs there are also a bunch of other new wooden blocks in this update including the wood blocks which you see here wood blocks are different from logs in that they don't have the top tree ring texture to them uh, same on the bottom so they have the same texture on every single side and the way you craft these, these used to be called bark blocks, by the way, in the snapshots, in case you guys are wondering. The way you make these are you take four types of any log, put them in a 2x2 two two in the crafting area, and you get your wood. So this is oak wood, for instance, and there's also, of course, all the other varieties, oak, birch, jungle, acacia, and dark oak. Uh, we also have the stripped variety of wood blocks. So if we go ahead and just right-click with an axe, you can see we get a stripped block similar to the stripped wood, but we don't have the very top ring texture. Instead, it's the same texture on every single side. And so just right click to strip those wood blocks and then you just harvest them the same way with left click. So there you have it guys, stripped wood and wood blocks now in the game. In addition to the wood blocks, we also have all new varieties of trap doors, pressure plates and buttons in every wood variety. So I'll just demonstrate here with jungle wood. So we have jungle wood button like that. We have jungle wood pressure plate like this. And then we have jungle wood trap door just like that. And so, yeah, you can see all the different varieties right here. All the trap doors, all the buttons, and all the pressure plates. Prismarine slabs and stairs have been added this update. And the recipes are as follows. So it's just the typical stair recipe with six blocks in the crafting table like that to get your... Prismarine stairs, and again, this works for any variety of prismarine. So there's prismarine brick stairs. And for the slab, same thing. Three blocks across just like that will get you your slab. And again, it works for any variety of blocks, just like so. So those are prismarine slabs and stairs, and they function just the same as any other slab and stair. The next set of new blocks are coral blocks. So we have five different varieties of coral blocks. We have the blue tube coral block, we have brain coral block, bubble coral block, fire coral block, and horn coral block, which is yellow. So yeah, those are the different varieties of coral blocks. And with these coral blocks, you have to place them in water. If you don't place them in water, they will actually die, which I can show you here. So if I place these down outside of water, you can see eventually after a short period of time, the coral blocks will actually die. Uh, there is some exceptions to this. You can sort of hide where the coral blocks are, or where the water is rather, uh, by using water log blocks, which we'll get to in a second. And then, yeah, the coral will not die in that case. And you might also be wondering exactly where we can find these coral blocks. Well, you can find these coral blocks in warm ocean biomes. So... 
We are currently in a warm ocean biome, and you can see we have a coral reef uh, right down here below us. So let me go ahead and grab my silk touch pick because you actually need a silk touch tool to harvest coral blocks. Uh, so yeah, if we go ahead and switch to survival game mode, you can see if I hop on over here and mine this block like so. And yeah, it actually will float up here, but there we go. That's how you get coral blocks. Go to coral reefs and mine out the coral blocks with a silk touch tool. One final thing about the coral blocks and the coral reefs. If you don't mine these blocks with a silk touch tool, you can still get a coral block, but it won't be a living coral block. Instead, it will be a dead coral block, like you see right here. So yeah, you can still get a block, but it won't be a living coral block. In addition to the blocks of coral, we also have just regular coral, which looks like this and has the same name and corresponding colors as the coral blocks. And yeah, that's all they, they look like right there. Uh, now these coral also cannot be placed outside of water and they have to actually be in a water source block to be able to be placed. So if I place a water source there, I can place the coral inside of it. Uh, however, I actually can't get rid of that source block without first removing the coral. Uh, so you can't have any dead varieties of these coral. Uh, these coral are found growing on coral blocks underground here. So if we take a look here, yeah, we can see a coral growing right there. And the way that you harvest these, if you're not in creative mode, is we want to, yeah, just use a silk touch pick on these, same as the coral blocks. And yeah, you can see you can harvest the coral in that manner. The final coral block we're going to take a look at is the coral fan. So this is a coral fan right here. We can harvest it with a silk touch tool like the other coral blocks. And of course the coral itself floats up to the surface. You can see that the coral fans can actually be placed on the side of the coral or the side of any block and also the top. So you can place it on either one. So as I just showed, you can place these coral fans on the sides of blocks or on tops of blocks, and that works the same for all the different coral fan varieties. However, you can also place the coral fans outside of water. So if I go ahead and place these down here, you'll see you can place all the varieties outside of water. However, very quickly, they turn gray and die. So you have some dead coral fans instead of the living coral fans. Uh, these can be harvested if we go ahead and just switch to survival game mode. If you have a silk touch pickaxe, you can get the dead coral fans back just like that. And so there are all of our dead coral fans there. However, there is another way you can cheat the system and make it appear that your coral fans are alive on the ground without any water nearby. And that is to use waterlogged slabs here. So if we have waterlogged sandstone slabs, we can easily put our coral fans on top of those waterlogged blocks. And yeah, these coral will not die despite the fact that they're technically not touching water. Uh, it's actually a waterlogged block they're touching, but that is allowed, so that's pretty cool. You can also put the coral fans on the surface of the water and then waterlog the block, and they will also survive this way. And also you can have them adjacent to water, unlike the coral tubes. So that is a little bit different than the other coral. The next block we'll take a look at is seagrass. Seagrass is found naturally generated on the bottoms of oceans, it's also found in swamps and at the bottom of rivers. Seagrass can generate with either one block or two blocks of height. And the way that you harvest it is you use some shears. So if I go into survival game mode here, you can see if I hit it with shears. Yep, there we go. Get the seagrass item back. And you can also bone meal the ground underwater to make a lot of seagrass generate naturally. So if I just go around here, See, we get a bunch of seagrass generating. If we hit the seagrass itself with bone meal, then it grows from one block to two blocks high, similar to how ferns work. We can also use dispensers. So if I get over here, place down ourselves a dispenser, put some bone meal inside. This will also work to generate seagrass on the ocean floor. And you'll see seagrass can also grow on uh, blocks which are uh, not typically able to grow uh, to grow plants on them, like dispensers and redstone and stuff like that. Uh, same thing applies to sea lanterns and other uh, blocks that are like transparent things. You can place seagrass right on those as long as there's a water block uh, above those blocks. So yeah, pretty interesting little block there, seagrass. Seagrass has one use right now and that is to breed turtles. So you can see here if I move around with the seagrass, you can see these turtles ever so slowly following me because they want to eat the seagrass and if I feed one, 
one piece of seagrass and the other another piece, then these turtles will breed. So there you go. Got the advancement there, and now the turtle's going to start digging into the sand and start to lay some eggs. So yeah, more on the turtles in a bit, but for now, yeah, that's the use of seagrass. The next underwater plant we're going to be taking a look at are sea pickles. Sea pickles generate in warm ocean biomes. They generate either on top of coral, as you can see right here, or on the ocean floor, like you see over here. And as you can also hopefully make out, sea pickles generate light. Uh, depending on how many sea pickles are in one block, they generate either a light level of 3, 6, 9, or the full 15 blocks with 4 sea pickles in there. And you can only place 4 sea pickles in a single block before you have to go to the next one and start placing uh, sea pickles there instead. So sea pickles are very, very useful for underwater lighting. As you can see, yeah, you can see the lighting uh, increase as I add more sea pickles in various areas. So that's pretty cool. You can also place sea pickles outside of water, as you can see right here. However, they don't emit light, but if you then put water on the sea pickles, then they will start to emit light once again. And they also gain some flowers uh, to their model. The sea pickle can also be put into a furnace, and in that case, the sea pickle turns into lime dye. So this is a new source of lime dye in the game. One final thing that's interesting about sea pickles is that if you bone meal a sea pickle on top of a coral block, it can actually grow more sea pickles, and also grow more sea pickles nearby the original sea pickles. So if I go ahead and just bone meal this a few times, you can see some sea pickles showing up around the original sea pickle there. So yeah, it's a pretty good spread range. However, like I said, if you don't have uh, coral blocks nearby, you'll see it only grows on this one coral block and not on the surrounding uh, sand or anything. Next up we have kelp. So these things right here, these plants are kelp plants. They grow in all the oceans. The way you break kelp plants, you can simply use your fist or a tool if you want uh, to break the kelp plant. And wherever you hit the kelp plant, that is the point above which all the kelp blocks will break. So if I break this block right here, the entire plant above that point will actually break. So if I do this, yeah, you'll see there are all the kelp pieces floating up right here, but the plant below that point will actually remain. So if I only broke off like the top one, then this plant can still grow back to where it was before. So uh, it's kind of like coarse fruit in that regard. Now the other things about kelp, you can actually plant it down on any water source block, so just like this, and it actually will grow from that point. If I go ahead and increase the random tick speed by a significant amount, you can see Kelp grows up just like that, and it will grow all the way up to the surface of the water. Uh, and then it can't grow anymore because there's no water above that. So let's just go ahead and reduce the random tick speed back down. Uh, so that basically opens up the possibility of kelp farming, uh, is what that does. And yeah, you can also use pistons and things to break the, uh, the kelp block at certain points. However, what you can't do is use bone meal. So if you use bone meal on a kelp block, I'll just show you here. It actually appears that it, it's working, but it actually doesn't do anything. So you can't bone meal your kelp block, although it grows quickly enough uh, that you don't really need to. So yeah, that is kelp. And kelp is actually a fairly useful block, so let's see what some of the uses are. So there's a bunch of uses for kelp. Let's take a look at those. So first use is you can smelt up kelp into dried kelp. And this dried kelp can actually be eaten as a food source. So I'll just show you that here. Dried kelp you can actually eat much faster than other food sources, so... Just like that, and it restores half a drumstick of hunger. So you can see, yeah, right there. Eat it right up, and yeah, like I said, restores half a drumstick of hunger, but the saturation is pretty poor. Uh, which is sort of balanced by the fact that you can eat it really quickly. Then, you can also take your dried kelp and turn it into dried kelp blocks by placing the dried kelp in a 3x3 crafting table, just like that. So there's our dried kelp blocks right there. Kind of a nice aesthetic block, which you can actually punch, and you don't need a tool to harvest it back. So there you go. Just like so. And then you can also use the dried kelp blocks as fuel in furnaces. So if I go ahead and put just one single dried kelp block in here, you'll see, yeah, it burns it up, and then it starts to smelt some of this iron ore. And it turns out that a single block of dried kelp can actually smelt 20 items, which makes it one of the best fuel sources in the entire game. 
And you might be wondering, since it can be burned in a furnace, is it actually a flammable block? And the answer to that, you can see right here, if I just go ahead and lay down a single uh, fire block right on the kelp blocks. Yes, indeed, it is indeed extremely flammable. And so just be aware of this if you use this as a building material, as it may be susceptible to lightning strikes. Side note, it actually does have to be fire that catches the kelp blocks on fire, because they cannot be ignited by lava. There are two new mushroom textures that you can get in Minecraft 1.13. The first is the stem block of the mushroom. So as long as you have a silk touch tool, you can harvest the stem just like that. And you can harvest this whole thing from the red mushroom or the brown mushroom. So that's the mushroom stem block right there. And that's what it looks like. Now you can also harvest the brown and red mushrooms. Of course, you could always do this uh, before in Minecraft 1.12 even. However, we also have a new porous mushroom texture. So this mushroom texture on the side of the mushroom block, that was actually not possible to get before, but now you can using either the red mushroom, the brown mushroom, or the mushroom stem. All you have to do is place down two mushroom blocks next to each other like this, and the area where the faces of the mushroom blocks meet will turn into the porous texture. So now if I break this block, you'll see that the porous texture exists. Uh, whereas before, if you just have a standalone block like this, you can see all sides are the same texture, just the red mushroom texture. Um, so that is pretty unique, and just to show you, you can do it with other types as well. So if I do the brown mushroom here, you can see there's the porous texture on the inside there, and the same thing with the stem block. If I do this, there is the porous texture on the inside right there. Another great change to the mushroom blocks is that pick block will now work with the mushroom blocks themselves rather than delivering the item to you. And it also works with the mushroom stems. So that's a great quality of life change. There's also been a slight change to one block in the game and that is the shulker box. So shulker box still crafted with shulker shells and a chest just like that. And you get your normal run of the mill shulker box. However, this shulker box is not the purple shulker box, as you can see here. It just says regular shulker box. Uh, that's because that is the new default color for the shulker box, and you actually have to dye it purple now if you want a purple version. And you'll see the purple version is, yeah, quite purple. So, yeah, that's a little bit of a slight change to the shulker box there. All the rest of the colors of the shulker boxes do remain the same, though. Shulker boxes can now be undyed in cauldrons simply by right-clicking them. So you can see it takes the color right off of the shulker box and returns it to the default color. There have been huge changes to ice in this update as well. First of all, packed ice can now be crafted with nine ice in the crafting table like so. And then the packed ice can be crafted up into a new block called blue ice. So here is what blue ice looks like right here. Blue ice has to be harvested with a silk touch pickaxe and it is significantly faster to travel on than either normal ice or packed ice and I can just demonstrate that here. If I go ahead and throw this item straight out here, I'll try and look dead straight here. Throw and hit Q right there and then I'll try and look dead straight here again and hit Q right here and we should see, yeah, the item on the blue ice went significantly further than the packed ice. And there's a corresponding uh, speed increase if you're on blue ice compared to packed ice or normal ice as well. Uh, blue ice also doesn't melt like normal ice. It can also send a redstone signal through it, as you see right there. And it also naturally generates in frozen ocean biomes. So it's very rare, but yeah, there are small deposits of blue ice naturally forming in the frozen ocean biome. Next block we're going to talk about is the conduit block. The conduit block is kind of a complex block. Looks like this. So let's go ahead and get into this and see what we need to make this thing. So to craft this, you're going to need a heart of the sea, which can be found in treasure chests, and a nautilus shell, which can be found as treasure in fishing and also is dropped by drowned mobs. So here's the conduit block right here. Once you have that, uh, the way to basically utilize the conduit block is to do the following. So we need to come down into the ocean here or into another body of water. Um, and we're going to go ahead and make a 5x5 five five square with the conduit in the center. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 blocks. 5 blocks up. 5 blocks over. And then 5 blocks down like that. I'm going to put a block right there and the conduit in the very center. And since this solid block is here, the conduit is not active yet, but as soon as I get rid of this, 
there we go. Our conduit is now active. You can see some particles traveling from the prismarine to the conduit block. And also there's a slight like heartbeat sound, which sounds pretty awesome. And so this conduit gives us a status effect, which is called conduit power. What this does is it allows you to breathe underwater, allows you to mine faster underwater, and allows you greater visibility underwater as well. Right now, the conduit has a range of 32 blocks, with 16 blocks uh, of prismarine here surrounding it. And for every 7 additional blocks that you add around the conduit, you get an additional 16 blocks of range for a maximum of 96 blocks in the maximum uh, configuration of the conduit, which we're going to make right here. So, in order to do that, you need sort of three rings of 5x5 five five blocks of prismarine. It uh, doesn't matter what type of prismarine it is, although you can't use the slabs and the stairs. I'm using bricks and dark prismarine here. And then once you have the maximum configuration for the conduit, the conduit texture will actually change. And if I get down into here, you can see there is now like an eye inside the heart of the sea, uh, showing that it's a maximum level conduit. So if I got rid of one block, for instance, like that, you'll see the eye actually closed. Uh, and if I put it back, the eye opens up once again. And once you see that eye, once you have the maximum level conduit, the conduit then takes on some special properties. So not only does it give it the maximum range, but it also now will damage mobs uh, within eight blocks of the conduit. So if I put down a drown here, for instance, you can see this guy is now taking damage from the conduit block. And it's also drawing in some particles to the drown itself until the drown perishes. A couple other details about the conduit you need to know. Number one, to receive the conduit power, you actually need to be in the water. So I'm not in the water right now. Even though I'm within range of the conduit, I'm not getting the conduit power and the effects of the conduit power. But once I get into the water, you'll see in the upper right hand corner, conduit power comes on and there is the conduit power effect once more. Now if I leave the water, you'll see the conduit power then begins to go away as soon as I leave the water. So you have to be in the water to get the conduit power effect. Next thing you need to know is that that also includes if it rains. So if I change the weather to rain here, you'll see that I once again get the conduit power. So yeah, conduit power is now active even though I'm outside the water because it is raining. So that is fantastic. If I were to, let's say, go over here underneath this overhang, then I would lose conduit power because I'm not, the rain is not touching me right here. I'm sort of under this overhang. Um, so you don't get the conduit power if you're under an overhang, even if it's raining. Another thing to note about the max level conduit is that the effects of the conduit affect all hostile mobs and also the effect stacks. So if you have multiple conduits, they can attack the same mob at the same time. And you can actually make conduit superstructures that kill thousands of mobs per hour. So if you're interested in that, I do have a video on the channel. I'll provide a link in the cards in the upper right hand corner now if you want to check that out. Another thing about the conduit structure is you can actually build one outside of the water. However, the interior of the 5x5 ring structure, the 3x3 the conduit sits in, has to be made up entirely of water. Uh, you actually can't place the conduit block outside of water at all, so you have to, have to place down water first and then place the conduit in the center like that. Now, you'll notice the conduit is not active here, even though it's in water. That's because this whole 3x3 here is not in water. So I can go ahead and place down some water here, some water here, some water here, and then we'll get on the inside here and place down water in the interior like this. And there we go. Yeah, now we have the conduit active. But we can make it a little bit tidier as well because you can actually use waterlogged blocks uh, within this 3x3 and the conduit will still be active. So uh, the way we do that is just place down a stair. You'll see right now it stops the conduit from working, but if we put a water bucket on the stair to waterlog it, it starts to work again. And so what that means is you can actually have a structure with blocks in here as long as they are waterlogged blocks. Uh, so you can look right in here, and yeah, you can see the conduit right down there, uh, fully active and working just fine. So, yeah, that is kind of interesting, but you have to make sure that these are waterlogged blocks. If they're not, 
here right there, the conduit has now stopped working since I put a full solid block there. So it has to be a water block or a waterlogged block only. So make sure you get that correct. Also a note about the range of the conduit block. Like I said, this maximum configuration is 96 blocks of range. However, that is not a cylindrical range, meaning it doesn't go up to world height like the beacon does. The range is instead spherical, so if you put something like this way up high in the sky or way down low, it's possible you may not get the effect uh, even if you are within the range horizontally. One small feature in this update is that pumpkins will now generate without the face carved into them. So you can see here we have a naturally spawned pumpkin patch, and yeah, all the pumpkins have no face carved into them. Uh, you can harvest these things if I just go ahead and switch to survival mode just like normal, so just like that, and you get the pumpkin without any face on it. However, if you want to make a face on the pumpkin, you can click on the pumpkin with a shear, just right click. You'll see the pumpkin will drop some pumpkin seeds, and whichever face you click on, that is where the pumpkin will be carved. And it's also quite important to note, if you have a, if you want to make like an iron golem or a snow golem, you can't use the regular pumpkin here, so if I jump up here, use the regular pumpkin, doesn't work. Uh, but if I use the carved pumpkin, you'll see that that actually does work. There we go. There's our golem. So make sure you're using the right kind of pumpkin, there we go, to make your golems and your snow golems. Blocks with silverfish inside of them are now called infested stone blocks, as you can see on the right hand side right here. So here's a regular stone and here is infested stone. And they've also changed in that when you now mine them, they will break instantly. So I'll just mine a few blocks here, and you'll see the infested one broke instantly. If I just break a few more here, boom. Yeah, very, very easy now to break silverfish blocks of any type. So just be aware of that, especially if you're going mining in the extreme hills biome. One very subtle recipe change that is not in the recipe book at all is that dispensers will now be able to be crafted with partially damaged bows. So you can see the recipe book actually doesn't show this. It actually doesn't show that you can use this partially damaged bow I have in the recipe. But if I go ahead and put in the cobblestone, put in the redstone, and then put in this partially damaged bow, you'll see it actually allows me to craft a dispenser. So you can now use partially damaged bows to make your dispensers. You don't have to get a full... A uh, fully repaired bow to craft it. When 2x2 two two spruce trees grow, they will now replace the grass and dirt around them and some blocks below them with podzol. Moving on to mobs and mob changes now. There was a minor change to squid in this update. If squid are attacked, you will see they now shoot out some particles of ink. Next up is the turtle mob. Turtles spawn on beaches, and if we go ahead and slay a turtle, you will see they actually do have a drop, and that drop is seagrass. So turtles will drop seagrass when killed, and that makes a lot of sense because they also will follow you if you're holding seagrass, and also if you feed them seagrass, they will breed, as you'll see here. Now watch here. You see this turtle here became pregnant. You can always tell the bigger turtle is pregnant. Uh, it's a lot bigger than the uh, the other turtle right here. And the turtles must be on sand to plant their eggs, which we should see here in a moment. And you'll see, yeah, it's doing the animation as if it's clearing out sand to place down a turtle egg. If the turtles are not on sand, uh, then they will not lay an egg. They will breed, but they won't actually lay an egg here. So you'll see this here in just a second. So there you go. You can see this turtle is pregnant, but it's not doing the digging animation because they're not on sand. Here we go. I think this turtle's about to, yep, lay an egg. There we go. Yeah, so you can see here, uh, we now have some turtle eggs down. Uh, these turtle eggs come in up to four in a block. So there's one, two, three, four. And there's a lot of subtleties with these as well. So let's go ahead and get into that. So first thing about these turtle eggs, like I said, they can be placed in up to four block configuration. Uh, you can also place them uh, in water. They'll actually replace water. You can step on these things. So you see here if I jump and step on these eggs, eventually they will break. And so it's, it happens after a random amount of jumps here. But if I keep jumping just like this, yeah, you'll see another one just broke, another one just broke, and then finally the last one broke. 
Now, the player is not the only mob that can jump on these eggs. So you can see here that if we have a zombie, zombies will also jump on turtle eggs that they find lying out in the open, and yeah, we'll destroy them. But zombies aren't the only ones that want to smash turtle eggs. We also have zombie pigmen, which also will jump on turtle eggs until they eventually destroy them, just like that. Turtle eggs can be mined and relocated by the player, and the way you do that is you get a silk touch pickaxe, and you mine each one individually here. So there's one popping off, two popping off, three popping off, and there's all four popped off of the block. Couple things about these turtle eggs. First of all, they hatch in three stages. They will each stage crack a little bit, and they also will emit some green particles. That's how you know the eggs are uh, progressing and about to hatch if it gets super, super cracked. Uh, and I can just sort of demonstrate that here by turning up the random tick speed by a significant amount. And we're also going to go ahead and switch it to night. So we're going to do time set midnight because the eggs actually will mature faster at night and there's a higher chance of them cracking. I'm just also going to go ahead and put down a few more eggs here and there. So there we go. And let's see if we can see, yeah, this is one of the stages right here. So you can see this is a little bit cracked compared to the other eggs. And there it goes again, cracked again. And eventually, as you just saw right there, the eggs crack and baby turtles emerge. So these baby turtles, they are a little bit vulnerable, especially when they're first starting off. And there's some more eggs hatching right there. And again, they go, they, the eggs uh, progress further at night. So yeah, it's more likely you see these turtle hatches during the nighttime. So once the baby turtles hatch, they will make their way to the water. And then they'll start swimming freely throughout the water. So there the, goes this guy right here. And all these guys you see there are all heading toward the water so they can swim off into the ocean beyond. Unfortunately for the baby turtles, they have a lot of natural enemies. Uh, some of those enemies include ocelots, which will actually try to attack baby turtles, as you can see here. Same thing with wolves. Wolves will also attack baby turtles, as seen right there. And the same is true for any undead mob. So things like zombies or wither skeleton will also try to attack baby turtles. Another interesting thing about these turtles is that the babies, to facilitate their growth, can be accelerated in their growth by feeding them seagrass. So you see some green particles as I feed each one of these guys some seagrass. And we're just going to pump them full of seagrass so they grow up very, very quickly. And the reason for that is because when they grow up, they drop a special item. And so we should see that once one of these guys, one of these two guys grows up, which is right there. And we actually just picked it up there. They drop a scoot whenever they grow up. They basically shed their old shell and drop the scoot. Now, let me show you what you can do with this. And before I forget, I also want to just mention that wherever a turtle is born at, it will return to that same beach no matter how far it swims away. So that's pretty cool that it comes back to the same beach over a very long period of time. So there are a few things you can do with the scoot here, and one of them is actually craft up an armor piece called the turtle shell. You can see this gives you plus two armor when it's worn on your head, and it also gives you a couple of other effects. So if I just pop this on here, you can see it gives us water breathing for 10 seconds. And it looks like this, a uh, little bit too big for me perhaps, but you'll see if we actually get into the water here that the water breathing effect actually goes away. So basically it gives you 10 extra seconds of water breathing when you're not in water. So yeah, once I get out of water, the effect comes right back. So that is what that does. That's one of the uses. Now let's take a look at the other use. So the other thing you can do with the turtle shell is that once you have it, you can put it in a brewing stand along with some awkward potions. And eventually that will turn into the potion of the turtle master, which gives you slowness four for 20 seconds and resistance three for 20 seconds. And you can also add on some modifiers to this. So for instance, you can put in glowstone dust and that glowstone dust will eventually lead you to 
a potion with slowness 6 and resistance 4 for 20 seconds. So this makes you move very, very slow. I can just sort of demonstrate this here. If I go ahead and drink this, there we go. And yeah, I'm actually moving, moving kind of slow. There we go. Yeah, super slow. So yeah, that is an interesting potion right there. And of course, there are other variants as well. So for instance, we have Splash Potions of the Turtle Master right here. Lingering Potions of the Turtle Master, as well as Tipped Arrows of the Turtle Master, which lasts for two seconds apiece. So yeah, those are some interesting things you can do with the turtle shells. Speaking of potions, there is also one potion brewing recipe which has changed, and that is the Potion of Slowness now, if you add Glowstone Dust to it. That simple Potion of Slowness with minus 15% speed will eventually become a Potion of Slowness 4 with minus 60% speed. So instead of just like a Slowness 2, you now get Slowness 4, uh, which is a significant increase over what it was previously, and that lasts you for 20 seconds. And likewise, we also have the Splash Potion of Slowness 4, the Lingering Potion of Slowness 4, as well as the Arrow of Slowness 4, uh, all of which may be useful in PvP combat. Next up, let's talk about the Drowned. So the Drowned are a new hostile mob in the Update Aquatic. They spawn underwater in ocean biomes, all ocean biomes, as well as swamps and rivers. And the light level has to be 7 or less for them to spawn, which typically isn't a problem at the bottom of the ocean. And they like to basically wander the oceans looking for players to kill. Now they come in a couple different varieties. You see this guy here, he spawned holding a trident. Uh, some of the other things they can hold are fishing rods and nautilus shells, which are used to craft the conduit. And they also have baby varieties of the drowned. And also up here, uh, you can see there are drowned chicken jockeys. And this guy is actually holding a nautilus shell and a trident. So that is a pretty rare spawn there. Uh, with them being on the chicken as well. So that is that. Uh, apparently also, even though it appears like this guy is totally out of water, um, yeah, it seems like he should be burning, but he is not. And I'll just show you here that drowned out of water do indeed burn. So there you go. And that guy is also holding a fishing rod, as you can see. So let's see what the drowned drops. So if I just go ahead and slay this guy right here, you can see he drops some rotten flesh. Drown also have a slight chance to drop a gold ingot. So if I just slay this guy, you see, yeah, he dropped a gold ingot along with some rotten flesh. And that's a rare drop of the drown mobs. So some important notes about drown that hold things. Drowns can only drop tridents if they are actually holding the trident in their hand. And if they're holding the trident, it's about an 8.5% chance they drop the trident they're holding. And that increases to 11.5% if you have looting 3. So let's see if we get lucky here. No, we did not get lucky there. However, this drown over here is holding a Nautilus shell. And Nautilus shells have a 100% drop rate. So we should get the Nautilus shell from this guy once he's slain. And there you go. So anytime you see a drown with the Nautilus shell, it is worthwhile to slay them because it'll always drop said Nautilus shell. So a couple of things about the Drown. Number one, the Drown will actually have a difficult time tracking you, if you're in survival, onto land, because they don't go onto land, during the daytime at least. However, some of these guys with tridents can still take pot shots at you occasionally uh, by throwing their tridents. Uh, however, if it is night, let me just go ahead and do time set night. There we go. Now they're all going to start coming toward me. And, yeah, they're all throwing the tridents. And, yeah, they're all coming onto land trying to get a piece of me. So, yeah, the main threat from the drown is during the night. But some of the ones with the trident can also uh, attempt to attack you on land during the day. So, as I said, the drown can spawn naturally in oceans, in swamps, and in rivers. However, you can also get zombies or husks which randomly walk into the oceans or rivers and drown. And they can become drowned themselves. So I'll just show you this here. So we'll put a zombie and a husk in there. Along with a zombie villager. Uh, the zombie villagers actually do not convert into drowned. So just be aware of that. And it takes about 30 seconds or so. For this process to occur in the zombie. And so we should see the zombie start to shake. After about 30 seconds. 
And then the husk will also change into a regular zombie. Sort of becomes rehydrated, if you will. Uh, meanwhile, the zombie villager will actually not do anything, but still can live underwater. So yeah, you see this guy shaking right now? That means he's about to become a drowned mob. And then after a few more seconds here, we should see... Yep, a drowned coming to being right there. Meanwhile, the husk just became rehydrated and is now a normal zombie. And the zombie villager is just doing his own thing over there. Uh, so now, next thing we should see is we should see this guy start to shake a little bit. And so there we go, this guy is now shaking a little bit. And he should soon convert into a drowned. So initially this guy was a husk. And now he is going to be converted into a drowned momentarily. There we go, yeah, cool. So, yeah, that is how drowned can form if they don't naturally spawn. Uh, which some of them do, like this guy's naturally spawned over here. Uh, so yeah, that is the drown mob. So now that we know that the trident drops from drown, let's go ahead and talk about the trident itself. So the trident is both a melee and a ranged weapon which you can throw. And you do that by holding down right click. And yeah, that basically charges it up. And then you can throw it. Now if I go into game mode survival, you'll see when you throw the trident, actually leaves your inventory and then you have to go and retrieve it just like that so yeah it uh, takes a little bit of time to charge up uh, it's significantly slower to charge up than a bow and also the attack speed is quite slow if you can see that on the screen um, so it's basically equivalent to a diamond axe in terms of its attack speed and damage so you can see their stats are pretty similar there and it's equivalent to about a level one enchanted bow in terms of the amount of damage you can put out with it over time. But it's only one time use. However, there are a bunch of enchantments that you can get on the trident itself. Which I'm going to show you now. So the first enchantment is loyalty. Loyalty basically determines if the trident will come back or not once you throw it. So if I go ahead and throw this, let's toss it way out there. Once the trident lands, here it land and then it comes right back to me just like that. And there are three levels to loyalty. The higher the level, the quicker the trident comes back to you after it lands. Next up we have Impaling. Impaling is basically a sharpness enchantment for the trident. Uh, so basically it allows you to do more damage against sea creatures. So if I go ahead and focus on this squid here. Boom. Instant, instant one shot kill of the squid with the Impaling trident. However, if we were to use the loyalty one, let's say. Come on over here. See, Squid survived that and was able to, uh, yeah, spray some ink on us and get away. So, yeah, Impaling just basically gives you more damage against sea mobs. Next up, we have the Riptide Enchantment. Riptide has three levels, and it basically allows you to move forward along with your trident when you throw it. So, if I just do this, you'll see, yeah, we got boosted forward. And, yeah, it's a decent way to move underwater. And it also has a really cool animation. If I just go ahead and F5 here. There we go. And you'll see, yeah. It sort of goes into like a little a bit of a spin cycle there. Uh, with the trident. So that's super cool. And you can also use this to launch yourself up and out of the water. Just like that. So you get pretty high up when doing that. So that's pretty awesome. It's also worth noting that when it's raining out, you can actually use the Riptide enchantment outside of the water. So you're actually... As long as you're touching water, similar to the conduit, uh, you can use the Riptide enchantment. The final enchantment you can put on the trident is the channeling enchantment. So the channeling enchantment only works during thunderstorms, and it basically allows you to channel lightning when it hits a mob. So you'll see if I just throw it normally, nothing really happens, nothing really happens, but if I throw it and hit this sheep, Boom! Sheep gets fried by some lightning. And if I hit this sheep, same thing. So, yeah, the only restriction is that the target you hit has to have sky access. So, obviously, it has to be raining on that target. And it also has to be storming out to use this enchantment. Finally, it's worth noting that you can indeed cross the enchantments on tridents. So, say if you wanted loyalty and impaling, you can do that. You can also put on channeling on this trident. However, it turns out that Riptide is incompatible with loyalty. So if you want loyalty 
on your Trident as well as Riptide, it's not possible. So just be aware of that. The next mob we're going to take a look at is the Phantom Mob. So you can hear the Phantom Mob here. It has a wing flap sound and also sort of screeches in the air. It has flapping wings, so obviously it's a flying mob. And it can spawn in the overworld with light level less than 7. Uh, it also spawns during thunderstorms. And the way it spawns is the light level has to be less than 7. The player has to have not slept for at least 3 days. And if that's the case, then each subsequent day the player doesn't sleep, the chances of phantom spawning becomes ever greater. And yeah, basically these phantoms will spawn about 20 to 34 blocks above the player in groups of 1 to 4. And that is only the case if the player is both above sea level and also they have uh, no blocks, no solid blocks above their head, so they have access to the sky. Now, phantom mobs are undead mobs, so what that means is they're harmed by potions of healing. See if I throw this at the phantom, he gets hurt. Uh, however, they are also healed by potions of harming. So there you go, this actually heals the phantom. Now if we switch to daytime, you'll see that the phantom will burn. And yeah, that's because it's an undead mob, so like zombies and skeletons, the phantom will burn during the daylight. So that is something to keep in mind for sure. Now, if I go ahead and switch this back to night time real quick, so we'll do time set night. There we go. Uh, and then we go ahead and summon in some phantoms. So we'll just do game mode uh, survival, and we'll summon in some phantoms here. Just summon in one phantom here. You can see how they sort of fly around here, and they sort of swoop in to attack like that and then they go up somewhat high and sort of circle around and they also have a pretty far detection range so you gotta be a little bit careful even if you think you've outran them so here he comes again swooping down I'll just show you yeah he sort of bites the player uh, and that's the uh, the whole attack there that they demonstrate so if you slay one of these phantoms then you actually get a new drop called the phantom membrane and this phantom membrane is somewhat useful. Let me show you what it can be used for. So the first thing it can be used for is in an anvil. If you place an elytra and a phantom membrane in the anvil, you can actually repair your elytra. So instead of using leather, you now use the phantom membrane to repair elytra. You can also use it in the brewing stand. If you have a phantom membrane and some awkward potions, those will brew up into potions of slow falling. And the potions of slow falling do exactly as you would expect. So let me just go ahead and go into survival game mode here and I will show you that we get the slow falling effect and if we jump off this cliff here you can see yeah it, we basically slowly fall down to a lower area so this can be very useful in terms of if your elytra breaks mid-flight and you happen to have one of these potions on you this thing could save your life it also helps you get down from high places and additionally it can help in Things like farming. So farming, you sometimes can trample your farmland if you're not careful, but with the potion of slow falling, you can jump as many times as you want to onto farmland, and the farmland will not be reverted back to dirt. So it has some niche uses like that as well. So that is the phantom membrane, the phantom, and the potion of slow falling. The next mob we're going to take a look at is dolphins. So dolphins are sort of an interesting mob. They will actually swim behind you, if you are swimming through the ocean, so you can see this guy is swimming around me and behind me. They also give you an effect called Dolphin's Grace, and that allows you to swim much faster than you otherwise would. You see I'm going pretty slow here, but once the dolphin joins up with me, yeah, I get some super speed in terms of my swimming speed. So that's pretty cool. A couple more things about dolphins. They like to throw around items which are floating. So you see this guy is playing around with this item right here. And yeah, occasionally bumping it with his nose and tossing it about. A couple more things about dolphins. Number one, if you attack a dolphin, dolphins will attack you back. So you can see, yeah, right there, they're actually attacking me in sort of a group now. Which is a little bit problematic because they do a significant amount of damage. Another interesting thing about dolphins is, as you just saw there, they will come to the surface to breathe every once in a while. Usually jumping out of the surface of the water and then landing back in. They can jump from one body of water to another, by the way. 
as long as those bodies of water are separated by just a couple of blocks. Also, dolphins can be slain. Uh, if I just slay this one here, you'll see that they actually drop raw cod. One interesting feature of dolphins is that if you feed a dolphin a piece of raw cod, you can see there are some particles that show up and the dolphin begins to head in one particular direction. Uh, in this case, he should be leading us to a ocean ruin or a shipwreck or something like that where we can find treasure. Uh, so let's just follow him. It looks like he is making his way over this direction. They are somewhat fast, so you might have to keep up. And yeah, it looks like he led us right to an ocean ruin. Fantastic. So yeah, if you feed a dolphin a raw cod, it will lead you to an ocean ruin where you can find some treasure. If a dolphin, for whatever reason, finds itself outside of the water, it'll jump around until it gets back in. And dolphins can last about two minutes outside of the water. After that, they begin to take suffocation damage. The horse model has also changed in Minecraft 1.13, and because of that, we also have some subtle changes to all types of horse armor. Another interesting change in this update is to skeleton horses. Skeleton horses will now allow you to ride them underwater. So if I just go ahead and get on down here, we'll let the horse sink down a little bit, and voila, we are now riding the skeleton horse underneath of the water in the ocean. And so, yeah, this is actually a quick and easy way to get around both on land and on the ocean now. So you see you can actually walk up blocks and everything and move around quite quickly underwater. So, yeah, skeleton horses can now be ridden underwater. Baby zombies will now burn in sunlight. There are four new types of fish mobs in the game in this update. They are the salmon, the cod, the puffer fish, and the tropical fish. And they all spawn in different biomes, which I'll talk about in a minute. But to catch them, you need a water bucket. And then you simply go up to the fish, right-click on it. And then hopefully, if you hit very accurate, there we go, we can capture our fish. And if you right-click again in a uh, body of water, or actually on land as well, just do this real quick, you can see, yeah, it spawns the fish again. And this fish will actually be persistent uh, throughout the world. So you can use it to make, for instance, an aquarium or something like that. Uh, it works the same for all the different types of fish. So for instance, if I go ahead and come over here, let's see if we can see some tropical fish. Yeah, here's some tropical fish right over here. If I just grab this one right here and then bring it back over here to the land somewhere, you can see the same tropical fish we caught is now uh, able to yeah, swim on the land in the water we placed down. So. That's a good way to transport fish and make things like aquariums because the fish that you catch in the bucket will not despawn. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, a couple other notes here. Let me just quickly make a little bit of a thing here. There we go. Uh, if I were to go ahead and put in a fish into an area here, then take out the water, you can see the fish actually flops around on land for a little while. And they'll actually try and make their way toward water while they're doing this. But, as with fish in the real world, if you just let it go for a little while, the fish eventually starts to suffocate and take damage. And yeah, it will actually drop its item, which is the cod, the raw cod, uh, once, it, uh, once it dies. And same thing happens with the bucket of salmon, the bucket of tropical fish, and the puffer fish as well. One interesting thing about the fish is that the puffer fish mob, as you can see right here, if you get too close to it, you'll see it'll actually expand a little bit. There we go, just like that. And if you get really close, it expands again. And if you touch it, it actually gives you poison for a few seconds. So, need to be a little bit aware of the puffer fish in case you accidentally run into it in the ocean. Another great change this update is that light will now propagate further underwater. What that means is, previously, light levels was reduced by three for every block light traveled through water. However, now that has been reduced to one, so the same as it is on the surface. So you can see here the light level is 14. And as I walk out from this glowstone, it goes 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, and it goes down by one for every block I go out from our light source. So what this means is it's now much easier to light up areas underwater. Another big change in this update is to swimming. So swimming is now no longer you moving forward like this and basically walking in the water. 
Uh, instead, there is now a swimming animation, so if I get down here and sprint forward, you can see, yeah, we actually have a proper swimming animation now, so that is super cool. Uh, if I stop sprinting, I then stop swimming. You can also notice my breath bar. If I surface here, watch what happens. You'll see the breath bar slowly increases, and now I have full breath. So it doesn't instantly refill like it used to, which has some implications. However, you also, to sort of counterbalance that, don't sink as quick. So if I go ahead and let go of the keyboard, you'll see I, s I sink down to the bottom very, very slowly compared to what I used to. However, you still can go down a lot quicker by holding shift, and so that is also somewhat useful. Another interesting consequence of the swimming animation is that you can now swim through things like this one block gap here, or perhaps this one right here, and you can see I am indeed inside the one block tunnel here. And it doesn't matter if there are solid blocks above you, you won't be able to stand up until you actually make it out of this one block tunnel, so there's not really that much of a uh, risk of suffocation damage. A couple other things that have changed about the water. Number one, the water will actually be lighter when you're further up and closer to the surface of the water. So you can see right here it's pretty light, but if I go down here, it gets darker the further we go down. Also, potions of water breathing, they don't affect your visibility underwater. Uh, neither does the respiration enchanted helmets, so both those things will not affect visibility underwater anymore. Luckily now, our visibility improves automatically when we go under the water. So if I go ahead and get underwater right here, like this, you see if I sink down here and just keep looking in the same direction here, my visibility underwater will actually improve over time. So you can see there's actually a coral reef just beyond our vision right now, but as it's slowly becoming better, the coral reef is becoming more and more visible over time. Uh, i got to be a little bit careful because of this drowned here, though. Uh, but yeah, you can see we can now see the actual reef over there, and that's because our, envi our vision improves over time. Another change to water in this update is that swamp biomes now have sort of a murky water color. You can see that over here. You can see the water changes from like a murky brown to a blue. And if I get into the water here, you can also see the change underwater. So here's the river biome. And then if I get over here into the actual swamp biome, like this, you can see that the water becomes a lot more cloudy. Uh, and then if I move back over into the river biome, that cloudiness goes away. So that is sort of an interesting thing. And also, speaking of the color of water, if we come over here, we can see that cauldrons now reflect the water color in the biome they're placed in. So here we have some cauldrons in the river biome, mostly blue, mostly blue. And then we start to transition here into the swamp biome. So you can see it becomes a little bit more murky and then a little bit more of a brownish green right here uh, once we fully get into the swamp biome. So that is another feature of this update. Next up we have waterlog blocks and the physics of blocks placed in water. So essentially what this means is that now when you place blocks in Minecraft, they actually look decent underwater. So you can see here if I place a uh, stair underwater, you don't see any streaky lines or anything and the... Uh, water actually fills the block itself. Same thing with slabs and fences and iron bars and trap doors, uh, glass panes and chests and ender chests. Uh, so those are just some of the blocks that can become waterlogged. If I go ahead and make my way out over to this area over here, I can explain a little bit better how this works. So right now if we place down a water source block right there, and we place down another block, let's say slabs here, you'll see that the water doesn't affect it as expected. So, yeah, there's no water in the slab itself. However, if I were instead to place the slab in this water source block, you'll see the water source stays, and the uh, slab is also in the same block now. So, yeah, that is what it means to be waterlogged, and we can waterlog this stair. So you can see the stairs now waterlogged here. Uh, we can waterlog this fence right there. But if I place it in a non-source block, you'll see it actually behaves as it used to. Uh, you can then waterlog it by simply right-clicking with a bucket, just like that. And so now this is a waterlogged fence. And so that, what it, that is what it means to be waterlogged. Uh, so same thing happens, you know, with the like the trapdoors, for instance. So here, 
we have a trap door that's not waterlogged. And if we right click it with the bucket, there we go. Now it is. Um, and so, yeah, that's how you waterlog things in the game now. So a couple applications of the waterlogged blocks. Things like waterlogged trap doors can actually hold back water uh, when they're actually waterlogged themselves. However, if you then open the trap door, for instance, the water can flow over the trap door because it's lower than the height of the water. And so the water flows out. We turn this back on, the trap door blocks the water once again. So kind of an interesting little way to create an interesting little water valve there. And the same thing with the water height applies to things like stairs. So the back of the stair is obviously going to be higher than the water we place down in the step of the stair. So the water will only flow out in one direction as you can see here. Some of the other things that can also be waterlogged include things like signs and ladders. And an interesting note about waterlogged ladders, they actually allow you to climb the ladder twice as quickly as when you're outside of water. So you can see here, yeah, there's definitely a speed change when I leave the water when climbing the ladder. Another thing about waterlogged blocks is that they all will display the drip animation. So you can see these stairs here are all waterlogged. Uh, if we get up top, you can see the water in the middle of all the stairs. And the same thing over here with the trapdoors. The trapdoors also have some drips coming through them. Although there is also some Z-fighting with the water texture, which I think is a bug. Uh, but yeah, these are definitely waterlogged. Uh, you can see the water coming through if we open the trapdoor here. So yeah, that's another feature of waterlogged blocks. There are also huge changes to how Minecraft works in regards to water mechanics. So now if we have items underwater, those items, instead of sinking to the bottom, will now actually float to the top. So if I just go ahead and throw a couple items out here, you'll see slowly all those items actually float to the surface of the water. So you can see them right here. And so that'll make items much easier to collect if you die in water. One additional mechanic is that soul sand and magma blocks have special properties. So if I go ahead and place down some magma blocks here, you'll see some bubbles forming above these magma blocks. So let me go ahead and place down a few more here so you can see it a little bit more clearly. There we go. Yeah. So you see these bubbles are all trending downward and if I go ahead and go into survival game mode you'll see that if I were to swim over this area I actually get transported down to the surface of the ocean. However I can also breathe these bubbles so I'm not losing any sort of, uh, of oxygen here, of, of air here. Uh, and then once I get off it, of course, I no longer can breathe here. Um, so these are an easy way to breathe underwater, but they also will suck you down. And um, if you try and swim up, you actually can't swim up in these water columns. Uh, another interesting thing is that if we're in a boat, uh, boats actually sink on these water columns, just like players. So your boat will actually start to shake and then sink. So yeah, interesting mechanic there. Soul Sand will actually do the exact opposite thing that magma blocks do. So instead of the bubbles uh, going down, they go up, and of course that actually pushes you straight up and out of the water at quite a good speed, I might add. So yeah, a lot of potential for elevators and item transport with these mechanics here. It also does work with items, which I can show you like right there. Actually launch that one up and out of the water. Uh, and then this one, it'll actually sink the items to the bottom of the water, just like that. Now you might think that these bubble columns wouldn't pose a threat to the player, but that's not necessarily the case because the downwards bubble columns actually do form naturally in the overworld. And that happens in underwater ravines, which you can see some of right here. So this is a naturally generated underwater ravine, complete with some obsidian, some magma blocks, and of course the bubble columns on top of the magma blocks. Uh, so let's just get on up here and like let's say you came across this in a boat. Let's just, uh, let's just see what happens. So if we just go ahead and hop on into our boat here, get on in here, and all of a sudden, our boat starts rocking, starts shaking, and then sinks to the bottom of the ravine. So, yeah, you do have to be a little bit careful of these ravines when you're roaming the oceans here. And speaking of these ravines, this is also a new terrain generation feature. So these underwater ravines now generate, and if we follow the ravine... To the end here we should probably see some underwater caves as well another feature of the new world gen is that underwater caves will now generate throughout the world so this is one such cave right here this cave is totally underwater as you can see and they got some seagrass growing here as well 
Uh, so these caves generate uh, underwater totally, under the oceans, and also usually next to ravines. So it's actually a pretty big underwater cave system right here uh, leading out to the ocean. Another change to terrain generation in 113 is the addition of ocean ruins. So this is one such ocean ruins. They come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes, and you can also get like small cities in some cases. Primarily they're made out of, you know, the granite and stone bricks and stuff, but you can also get some in the lukewarm and warm oceans, which are made out of sandstone. And usually these ocean ruins will have a chest which you can find inside of them. So let's just see if we can find it here. We'll just dig around a little bit. Looks like it's right there. And there we go. We got some good stuff in there. Looks like a fishing rod and some wheat and some coal. So yeah, a little bit of loot in these ocean ruins. And in addition to the ocean ruins, we also have another new structure in the oceans, and that is shipwrecks. So here is one such shipwreck right here. Uh, this seems like a mostly intact shipwreck, but you can get some that are, you know, half ships or uh, sort of in, in like crazy configurations, like on a mountain somewhere or something. Uh, but if we go on down into here, we should see a couple of chests. And if we look on in here, apparently... There we go, yeah. Just took a while to generate. Uh, we sometimes get these, some buried treasure maps. And what these do are exactly what you'd expect. They lead you to buried treasure. You can see that X on the map there. So let's see if we can find this location. It looks like we need to go north... northeast here from this location. So let's just get on out here. And there, there actually might... Since this is a bigger ship, there might be another chest somewhere. Yeah, there is another one here. And yeah, we got some decent stuff inside there, so let's just grab all of that. And let's go and find this treasure. Alright guys, so we made it to the location of the map. You can see we're filling out the map as we go here. But we already passed the X here, so let's turn back around. And it looks like on this small island here is where the treasure is. Yeah, it looks like it's right on the point right there, or so. And let's see here. Looks like I'm pretty much... Go back up a little bit. Looks like I'm pretty much on it right here. So let's just go on down here and dig in a little bit. See if we can find it. Oh, there it is right there. Okay, yeah. Cool. So yeah, then you look into the treasure chest. And in the treasure chest, you'll find a heart of the sea. So that'll be uh, in a one stack with by itself. Uh, and then you should find some pretty decent loot as well. Some diamonds, emerald, gold, iron, TNT and some food as well. So, pretty decent loot in the treasure chests if you do find them using the map. Uh, but just remember the X is sort of approximate and not like an exact uh, science. So you may have to dig around a little bit. I actually had to dig around quite a bit to find this one here. But uh, yeah, that's how you find treasure chests and how you find the heart of the sea right there. Another world generation change is that ravines can now cut through sandstone, terracotta, red sand, and also mycelium blocks, which they couldn't before. So that means you can now find ravines in deserts, as well as in mesas and mushroom islands. One of the most important changes this update, witch huts will now naturally generate with a mushroom in the flower pot. One big world generation change in Minecraft is that the ocean biomes have now been split up into different biomes. So here we have the frozen ocean biome. You can see its main features are giant icebergs of packed ice and snow, along with a lot of ice covering a large portion of the ocean surface. And these frozen ocean biomes also have a very small amount of blue ice, some of which you can see right here, which naturally generates. And in addition to this, the icebergs also extend fairly far underneath the surface of the ocean. You can see this one actually goes all the way down to the ocean bottom. And speaking of the ocean bottom, the ocean bottom in the frozen ocean biome is devoid of plant life. So there's no kelp or seagrass that grows here. A couple more things about the frozen ocean biome. Salmon are the only fish that will actually spawn in the frozen ocean. So you can see here we have all salmon uh, down here. They're the only fish type that will spawn here. And also polar bears. You can find polar bears spawning in the frozen ocean biome, and they can actually spawn on top of ice. So you'll actually find quite a few of them here since a lot of this is covered with ice. So that is the frozen ocean biome. Next up we have the cold ocean biome, which you can see right here. Cold ocean biomes can have both salmon and cod spawn in it. So you can see, yeah, there's some cod right there, and there's some salmon right up there. 
They also do have plants that grow in them. So we have kelp growing here and some seagrass as well. And the bottom of the cold ocean biome will be made out of gravel primarily. So you can see a lot of gravel around here. And that is sort of a defining characteristic of if it's a warm or cold biome, whether or not it has gravel on the bottom. So, yeah, that is the cold ocean biome right there. And if we get over here, you can see a little bit of a change of color in the ocean from sort of a deep blue over here to more of a teal blue over here. And that marks the transition between the cold ocean and the regular ocean right here. So if we look right here, yep, regular ocean. Dolphins, like I said, can generate in this area as well as cod. Cod can also generate in the normal ocean. Uh, and of course you have squid as well. So that is the normal ocean biome. Next up we have the lukewarm ocean biome, which has much more of a teal color than any of the other ocean biomes we've seen so far. The lukewarm ocean also will have a lot of different types of fish. So you can have the puffer fish right here. You can also have some tropical fish, some dolphins, and some cod spawning in this biome. So that is the different types of fish that you can see here. Here's some tropical fish, for instance, right there. And you can also see that the ocean floor here in the lukewarm ocean biome has sand instead of gravel. So the warm ocean biomes will have sand on the bottom uh, and the cold will have gravel. And also the ocean ruins, instead of being made out of stone bricks, they will instead be made out of sandstone. And the last new ocean type is the warm ocean biome. This is where you'll find the coral reefs. And of course you'll find a bunch of different tropical fish here along with puffer fish and dolphins. You can also find sea pickles here growing on the corals as well as coral tubes and coral fans. There have also been terrain generation changes in the nether this update. So for instance, there are no longer lava lakes below a certain point in the nether. Instead, there are these caves which generate in sort of like a dome structure and they have lava filling them up to a certain point. They also usually generate in groups. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty. Yeah, we have like 14 or 15 in this one little region right here. And these generate very close to the bottom of the nether. You can see some bedrock right down there. And yeah, they're not really useful for anything, but it's kind of interesting that the terrain has changed in that way. So be careful and don't fall into any of these domes these cave domes in the nether. One small world generation change is that mushrooms no longer generate on top of the nether roof. So there's no more mushrooms up here. It's all just bedrock and air. You can now place item frames on both the ceiling as well as the floor. And this is really nice because you can also put maps in those item frames, which look really great as a floor map. Another great change to furnaces in this update is that furnaces will now accumulate experience even when items are being smelted or taken out by hoppers. And once a player takes out a single item from a furnace, you get all the experience from all previously smelted items that have gone through the furnace. So for instance here, if I just lock this here, we have 28 items. So if I take out the next item that comes through the furnace manually, then I'll get all the experience from the now 29 items that have smelted. So there you go. We got two and a half levels it looks like from taking out that one ingot. Now I'm not sure if there is actually an upper limit on this or not, but potentially if you use a mass smelter, you could end up getting many, many levels from just pulling a single item out of your furnaces every once in a while. Next up, we have a lot of changes to maps. First of all, maps will now render things like cobwebs and beacons and cauldrons and mossy and regular cobblestone wall, and a whole bunch of other blocks which they didn't before. Uh, there's also been some changes to how stained glass is rendered. Uh, it now renders stained glass without a block underneath of it, so that's great. Also, maps have been made significantly more useful. So if I go ahead and place down a banner here, for instance, just go ahead and place one right there, and then right-click the map on the banner, you'll see it places down a banner, a banner of the same color uh, right where I placed the uh, original banner there. So that's pretty awesome. If I go ahead and place down another banner, let's say over here of a different color, right click it, you'll see that also shows up on the map. Another cool feature of these maps is that banners which are named will have their names appear on the map as well. So if I place this banner down, which is named Creeper Farm, and then right click it here, you can see 
it actually shows up and says Creeper Farm on the map, uh, right where I placed that banner. In addition to placing cocoa beans on jungle logs, you can now place cocoa beans on strip jungle logs, jungle wood, and strip jungle wood. There is also a new effect for fireworks in this update. So what we have now is we have a way to fade the fireworks. So if we have a fireworks star, let's say we have a bunch of these white ones here, and we want to have it fade to a color, we just put the fireworks star in with a dye, let's say a purple dye, and you'll see we get the fade to purple effect. So if we go ahead and then put some more gunpowder in here, and we'll get some paper in there as well to make the actual firework. We'll get a firework that will fade from white to purple or whatever color you want it to fade to. So I'll just show you what it looks like here. There's the white, and then it slowly fades into purple. So let me just show you a few more of those. So there's the white, and it fades to purple. Nice. One great change in this update is that things like pumpkins, carved pumpkins, jack-o'-lanterns, and fence gates no longer require a block below them to place. Levers, when turned on, will now emit redstone particles in a very subtle manner. Note blocks can now be moved by pistons, as you can see right here, and it also includes note blocks attached to slime blocks, so very important change there. Crops now require sufficient light level to be able to place them down. So you can see here I have blocked all the light to this piece of farmland here. And I'm right clicking and I cannot place down either the carrot or the potato. However, if I get rid of that block, we now have sufficient light and can now place this thing down. So just be aware of that. You won't be able to place crops on a farmland that is not lit up properly. Vines are now able to be placed standalone on the ceiling only. Chest placement has also changed in 113. You can now place two double chests next to each other of the same type, and also single chests of the same type directly next to each other. First of all, the double chests, that's pretty easy. You can just, you're now allowed to do that, so just place down two double chests. Um, so you don't have to alternate regular and trap chests anymore uh, if you're doing it like this. For the single chest next to one another, all you have to do is place down the regular chest, then shift and right click the chest that you want to be a single chest on the block next to this first chest. And there you go. Two single chests right next to each other. So just shift and look at the block. Now if you wanted any one of these to be a double chest, so let's say you wanted this last one to be a double chest, shift and look at the chest right there. And then it connects up and you got yourself a double chest. So pretty interesting. And you can see sort of how it works here. Let's just do single and let's just do double there. So. Yeah, a lot of interesting changes to chest placement in this update. You can now place buttons on the floor and on the ceiling in all four different directions, just like that and like that. Mining snow layers now with a silk touch tool will drop snow layers rather than snow balls. You can now use wooden bowls as fuel in furnaces. A recipe book similar to the one we have for crafting is now available in the furnace. If you click on it, you can see it shows you all of the different things that are available to smelt. And it shows you how to put them in the furnace, including all of the different types of fuels that you can use to smelt whatever item you're trying to smelt, and then what it turns into as well. So quite an extensive help there for any players who are new to the game. Another interesting change is that blocks with a collision box now have matching bounding boxes. So, for instance, blocks like anvils, hoppers, brewing stands, lily pads, fences, glass panes, iron bars, vines, things like that, uh, now have subtly changed in their, uh, and how the player interacts with them. So, for instance, before a hopper used to take up an entire block, now that is not the case. The model actually matches the texture. And what we see here, so we can actually open this chest underneath the hopper, whereas before we couldn't. It would be like if, as if there was a solid block there. Uh, so that's a nice quality of life thing. And I can show this further here. If I get right up to the hopper, you can see I actually can't fit under it. But if I crouch under it, and then scoot under, and then let go of crouch, I actually don't stand up. Like there's no, there's no difference uh, because I'm actually hitting, my head is actually hitting the uh, the side of the hopper right here, these two pixels right there. Now if I back out, you see I automatically stand up. So yeah, that is just a bounding box change. Same thing with the anvil here. If I walk forward on this anvil, you'll see that I will actually step up onto this front part of the anvil uh, before being uh, stopped by this uh, part of the anvil. It's a little further back. So just watch subtly. 
boom, I went up a few blocks and I'm back down. If I shift, it's a little bit more apparent. Boom, and I walk up slightly. I walk up 0.25, a quarter of a block right there. Uh, doesn't happen, of course, on this side because the anvil sticks out on this side compared to the, the base. And then the same thing happens with the brewing stand. I'll just show you here. So I'll step up subtly onto the brewing stand and I'm actually stepping onto this pad right here. So yeah, that's an interesting small little change to bounding boxes. And this also happens for other blocks. Activated beacons now have sounds when the beacon beam becomes active. Another small detail is that flint and steel, when fired out of a dispenser, will no longer take durability damage if it doesn't ignite anything. So you see here, no durability damage taken, but if it actually lights a fire, then the durability does go down. And also, related to this, flint and steel can now no longer place fire at invalid locations. So like on the side of this block, you used to be able to ignite it for a split second, but that's no longer the case. There are also some subtle changes to things that you might not at first notice. One of those is that you now crouch in a much more smooth way. So if I go ahead and crouch here, you'll see instead of instantly changing from one height to the other, it's pretty smooth. If I look at this, you can see it a little bit better. Up and down right there. And the same thing with the elytra taking off and landing. It's a lot smoother and not quite as jarring as it was previously. So yeah, if we just fly on in like this, you should see. Boom. Yeah. A lot smoother. Some items in Minecraft now have colored text depending on their rarity. For instance, the beacon, the end crystal, and the music disc all have this sort of teal blue indicating that they are rare items. Then the ender dragon head, the totem of undying, those both have yellow text because they are uncommon. And then the epic items, the dragon egg and the enchanted golden apple, they have purple text because they are super rare. There's also been some changes to the colors of the tools. So for instance, the attack attributes for the diamond pickaxe and all other tools have been changed to green, as you can see here and on these other tools here. We also have advancements that have had color changes. So now the text describing the advancement is green for regular advancements and for the challenge advancements, it is purple. There are four new advancements in this update, one of which is to catch a fish, called Fishy Business. One advancement is to throw a trident and hit an entity. There we go. Another advancement is called Tactical Fishing, where you catch a fish in a bucket. The final advancement is to, during a thunderstorm, use a trident with channeling on it to change a villager into a witch. And that advancement is called Very, Very Frightening. So guys, with that, that's going to be all from me from the update Aquatic. Lots of really interesting and really cool changes to the game coming in this update. Hopefully you guys found this video interesting and informative. If you did, please do leave a like and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this on this channel. Anyways guys, hopefully you all enjoyed the update and thanks once again for watching. This has been Cub. Goodbye.